<laughs> right, well, thank you all very much for coming along. Um, and the theme of today's talk is the elephant, which is another symbol, as you can see here from this diagram. But before I start my lecture today, I should mention there's been something of a cultural revolution going on in the English-speaking world, and as we're amongst anthropologists, I can't let it go unnoticed. Some of you might have realised that the men's necktie is dying out. And that Prince Harry even went to a, an official function without a necktie. And even President Obama. But the big revolution was last Thursday when the British House of Parliament abolished the obligation for men to wear neckties. So the necktie is dead. <laughs> And Richard, I'd like to donate this to the Fabrinius Institute for your, uh, uh, your cabinet of ethnographic curiosities. Because <laughs> now, we have seen that Lakshmi, the Hindu goddess of wealth and good fortune, is associated with a number of key symbols. The lotus, rice, the elephant, the mango, that's next week, and the bride, the week after, which are depicted in the popular iconography and sung about in, in the sacred poetry of the Guru Mais of Basta, who use the idiom of kinship um, <coughs> to uh, structure their narratives about them. The lotus and the rice we have seen, I hope I don't keep dropping that again, Lotus and rice, have we have seen, symbolise the goddess Lakshmi in the fetal stage and the girlhood stage of her development, respectively. Today, I want to shift the focus of attention from the children of wealth, that is to say, the lotus and rice, to the parents of wealth, and in particular, to the elephant, or Irrawati, the female elephant, who is depicted as Lakshmi's mother and is the personification of water. Irrawati's other form, gods in India have many, many different forms, is associated also with Mengen, the monsoon rain. Mengen means cloud, and the Hindu poets liken the approach of the monsoon clouds to the approach of a herd of elephants. I suggested that these symbols, being symbols of wealth, pose the question of value, or rather of disagreements about value, because people disagree. They often share things, but they disagree. But um, so what interests me is disagreement. And valuation is a process of ranking things as people as the same or different, equal or unequal, hierarchical or identical. And so, so far we've considered two symbols of Lakshmi, the lotus on which she sits, and the rice, which sometimes fall from her hand. Now for the women singers of Busta, children are the supreme form of wealth. And the lotus, the primordial symbol of Lakshmi, is the supreme form of wealth in the form of newborn baby girls. Because the newborn baby girl is the epitome of, aus of auspiciousness as a value, that is to say, the harbinger of future reproductive success of the human condition. Next comes rice, superior to gold because it's reproducible and has a uh, food grain, which is superior to millet, which for the people of Buster Plateau is associated with drought, poverty, and misery. So these values inform ritual activity in Buster, the most important being the annual harvest rice ritual, when rice is ritually wedded to Vishnu. And, um, and last week, I con contrasted these, the rituals we find in Buster to, or the rituals in India, with those in China. And um, we saw that elite myths and rituals of India associate kings with warfare and elephant, not farming and not royal ploughing rituals. A partial explanation for this, I suggested, is to be found in the relative inefficiency of Indian-type rice cultures compared to those 
found in China and other parts of Asia, which is due to the landform and, and rain. And, uh, and basically, on the Indian plains, there is an inadequate water is very unreliable, which means that the transplant method, transplantation method of production cannot be used. Now this brings me to the symbolism of the elephant I want to address today. If the, if the elephant is associated with kings and warfare, why are they also associated with Lakshmi? Lakshmi is an egalitarian, vegetarian goddess concerned with life. Blood, sacrifice and conquest are anathema to her. How can this one symbol express such radically different values? And to answer this question, we have to pose another that takes us back to the lotus, Lakshmi's primordial symbol. For the guru Mahas of Buster, the lotus is a supreme form of symbol, as I said, children in the form of a newborn baby girl. But this egalitarian width, uh, area is not uniform, to the contrary. This map here shows India's sex ratio as depicted in the recent uh, census. And ideally, for every 1,000 girls, there should be 1,000 boys. But what is happening in India, as we see on that blue side, the ratio has fallen below 900. And only in the, the wetter eastern side do we find the ratio was up close to 1,000. Now the values revealed in this data are obvious. Boy babies are more highly valued in girl babies in Western India, but not in Eastern India. So there's a, a bias here. And these values inform the actions of parents when their amniocentesis tests reveal the sex of a fetus. In other words, scientific female infanticide is the norm in Western India. <clears throat> so that raises the question, why are females devalued relative to males in Western India? And as it was said, the, the, um, um, basically this area here, more or less one to one, this area here, it even gets down in some areas as low <coughs> as uh, 700 to 1,000. So it's really quite dramatic. Are these Western values associated with the warrior kings of Western India who rides an elephant and who has no time for rice ploughing rituals? Now what I want to suggest is at stake today are two competing myths of wealth. The myth of Mother Earth versus the myth of Mother Water. And what I want to suggest is the myth of Mother Earth is the dominant Indo-European wheat-centric conception that holds that labour is a source of wealth and earth is the mother of wealth. And a subordinate rice-centric conception of wealth which holds that labour is the father of wealth and water the mother of wealth. And in this India, this battle between myths is a battle between myths about Sita and myths about Lakshmi, who I will elaborate today. And these myths, I want to suggest, have real-life consequences, as we saw in these uh, demographic ratios. And what I shall argue is the dominant hierarchical Brahmin values have their origins in, the, uh, in this... Oh. <laughs> they have their origin in this zone up here. Now, <clears throat> so what I wanted to start off with then is this rice-centric, women-centric image of Lakshmi we find in Buster, and then we will look at, the, at the, its opposition. Now, I begin, as I said, with this rice-centric Eastern myth, Guru, Guru Mai's story of the elephant in the Lakshmi Jaga Epi. Now, this epic, I said, was a 31,000-line story, and it has a number of strands which are woven together. One strand concerns Irrawati, the female elephant, and I stress it's the female elephant, not the male elephant. The female elephant, and she also has a poetic parallel called Karabati, so 
She enters her story in chapter 7, which tells the story of King Men and King Queen Mangan's journey from the upper world to the middle world. Mangan insists that Meng, Queen, uh, Queen Mangan insists that King Meng take her to the middle world. He reluctantly agrees when she stages a hunger strike in order to get her way. As they're about to leave, can you see that there? They, he says they cannot go because he cannot leave all his property behind. His granaries, his treasuries, their cows, their pigeons, their peacocks, their parrots, their monkeys, their dogs, and most important of all, their elephants. They are kings, these people. <laughs> Lots of property. Mengen replies that they can take the property with them on their chariot and they travel down to the middle world via... Oops, oops something happened. I'm not used to this thing. By the spider's web. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, right. Upon arrival, they set up a palace and they set up a camp. And um, um, on upon arrival, they get a palace built and they're installed as king and queen. Mengen, concerned about her fame, insists on getting a Tulsi shrub and a well dug, and she hosts a performance of Lakshmi Daga, but is still desperately unhappy because she has no children. So, wealth and happiness, no children, unhappiness. And to overcome this problem, she um, tells Meng to fetch a mango from Shiva. The mango will be the subject of next week's lecture. Shiva agrees, but on condition that Meng, if Meng falls pregnant, uh, and as I said last week, eating a mango is a widespread belief in India that when women eat mangoes, they get pregnant. Um, and when she eats the mango and gets pregnant, uh, he will become... He'll, she'll become the wife of his younger brother. Meng brings the mango home and plants it. After some years, they go to the inspect the, uh, the elephants, uh, inspect the mango on their elephants. When they note that the tree has reached maturity, they host a wedding for the tree. And, um, <clears throat> and while the Guru Mahas sing about this episode, people gather and celebrate the wedding of the mango, which only has one spouse. <laughs> There's a Problems of interpretation there. Come back week six. <laughs> and um, so after the wedding of the mango, um, she eats the mango, she falls pregnant, gives birth to Lakshmi, but the newborn baby refuses to suckle. And um, Ming promises the baby his granaries, his treasuries, his cows, his pigeons, his peacocks, his parrots, his monkeys and his dogs, but she still does not suckle. Finally, he promises her the elephants and she begins to suckle. <laughs> when Lakshmi grows up, she weds, he, she weds Narayan or Vishnu as per the mango contract and um, after the wedding, they leave on an elephant. Now, Men gives his daughter Lakshmi the promised hour of the elephant another property and, and the newlyweds head home riding the elephants. Narayan's co-wives, who are very jealous of Lakshmi, make life a misery for her. The harassment reaches its climax when they put um, animal feces in the food. Narayan gets fed up with this, with, uh, with uh, Lakshmi's apparent incompetence as a housewife, and gives her two beatings. She swells up like a granary in the first, and her skin comes off in the second, and she decides to leave home via a tunnel dug by the rat and of course the elephant goat and she asks all the entourage and they all say we all want to go with you. <coughs> of course when Lakshmi leaves what happens? Poverty and misery descend upon the house <laughs> and they get very worried and then the Ryan goes, um, goes in search of her and, and makes many unsuccessful attempts to try and woo her back. Finally, he disguises himself as a spirit medium and convinces Lakshmi's elephant, uh, Mahut, the elephant rider, to let him look after the elephant while uh, he is out grazing. While he does this, he sneakingly puts an apple up the trunk of the elephant, which makes it sick. Lakshmi gets very, very anxious about this, and 
and um, he says, I'll only, uh, I'll only fix the elephant up if you will marry me. He's disguised. <laughs> and she finally agrees. He removes the apple from the elephant's trunk and uh, he reveals who he is and they live happily ever after. <laughs> Lovely story. So, <clears throat> as I said, the, um, we now come to the uh, analysis of the story and the basic symbolism that informs this story is well known to all healthy speakers. Everybody knows that Lakshmi's life cycle is likened to the life cycle of rice cultivation. Everybody knows too that the journey of Ming and Mengen from the upper world to the middle world is likened to the coming of the monsoon rains. The, meta <coughs> the metaphor is extended to the realm of kinship and the allegory gets a life of its own. Um, <coughs> the elephant uh, accompanies Meng and Mengen on the journey to earth and forms part of the wedding diary. Everyone knows that the elephant is associated with the monsoon rain, but the precise genealogical connection is not apparent in this epic. But another version gives us a, uh, the genealogy. This is sung by women 40 kilometres south. In this version, Lakshmi is reborn four times. People can be reborn a lot in India. Uh, <laughs> in her first birth, she emerges from the milky ocean clinging to the ear of her mother elephant. Um, Irrawaddy, or Irrawaddy as the name of the, the river in Burma. The second birth is from the womb of Mengen after she reaches earth and the um, and then um, the um, the monsoon rains and the elephant then are really two forms of Lakshmi's mother. The journey of the elephant in Guru's my story from the sky to the earth as a wedding diary traces out the matriline. So the um, and this is called the, the milk line in Buster. It's, it's a very important lineage. So the, and, but I, I think what's important is when women get married, they become part of their husband's line and they are, their property is really appropriated by the husband and is a sense in which, as we saw here, the Vishnu or Narayan is a warrior king and we can see he got this elephant by deception <laughs> and uh, establishes control over it, which is a, and <clears throat> so the elephant then becomes for him, the female elephant becomes very important for him because they are very good for catching male elephants, which you want for your, um, for your, your warfare. So Vishnu is not a farmer, he's a warrior. <laughs> and here he is, and this association of kings as warriors with elephants is culturally specific to India. I was just speaking to Mamadou and he confirmed that elephants in Africa are not captured or tamed. And in fact, so it's a, uh, it's a very much an Indian thing. Now the cultural history of the arrival in Buster, uh, the cultural history has its counterpart in the natural history and geography of food grains. So the, the cultural history of the arrival of Lakshmi as rice has its counterpart in the natural history of rain and food grains in India. Where there are as rains, there there is rice. And we can see that there is a, uh, an association there. But the important thing I want to stress in this epic, so here is, uh, this is rainfall, basically Chattisgarh, where Roland and I work was perhaps in the wettest area and the heaviest area for Lakshmi epics. Uh, there's a bit more down here as well. But over here we have the dry grains. And notice that wheat is up here, but um, Buster is on this border of the millet and rice, and which gives the myths of this area their cultural specificity. They make no mention of wheat. So wheat, wheat is for the first time is now being introduced but there is really uh, no wheat in the epics. And, um, but what's interesting is that as we travel across Buster, from here to here, the, the proportion of uh, wheat declines and millets goes up. So Buster is culturally specific and you have this antagonism between millets and rice, which is how come millets is represented by wealth because it's much more productive Sorry, that rice is associated with wealth, millets with poverty and dry grains. So, 
So the um, so as I said, the wheat is not part of everyday life and not part of the poetic imagination of the people. But we will see that um, um, the this is precisely the opposite, and all the Brahmanical values have their origins in this wheat growing and uh, cattle country up there to the top. And we see that the ancient Brahmins and kings have appropriated the elephant and erected a set of values grounded on wheat and, capital, and cattle that celebrates India's dry zone and devalues the wet zone. Now this assertion is, I want to assert, is uncontroversial and is illustrated in great scholarly de detail in a wonderful book by Francis Zimmerman called The Jungle and the Aroma of Meats, an Ecological Theme of Hindu Medicine. He reveals that these values are the product of elite values resident in the Delhi Doha, that area up there to the northwest, and shows also that they make good common sense from their perspective. And the, um, the, now he looks at these ancient Sanskrit medical texts and what we find is they make a distinction not between the north and the south as anthropologists are prone to do but between the dry, healthy west and the wet, unhealthy east which is very important where wealth becomes a, um, a form of good uh, life and happiness. And he notes that, quote, all the values of civilization lay on the side of the jungler. In fact, what's interesting, the word jungle in English, uh, it's changed its meaning, it's been turned upside down. <laughs> Originally, jungle meant this dry, arid zone, <laughs> and its meaning has been turned upside down. So you have to turn your heads back upside down and get back in history. Um, and the, he made this distinction between the dry, healthy west and the Anupa, the marshy, unhealthy east. And he says, uh, I quote again, all the values of civilization lay on the side of the jungle. The jungle incorporated land that was cultivated, healthy, and open to Aryan colonization, while the barbarians were pushed back into the, the insalubrious, impenetrable lands. <clears throat> and these values are quite explicit in the ancient law books. I quote, let him, the king, take up residence in a jungular place where the cereals, i.e. wheat and barley and so on, are abundant and where the Aryans predominate and which is free from disorders, i.e. it's healthy. Now, Simmerman's approach to the analysis of these values is an exemplary account of the need for the, an approach that situates valuers in their historical and geographical context. His analysis is very complex but I limit myself here to three of his central points, as they can, three uh, defining characteristics of this prior, uh, polarity, health, food, and animals. And I'll deal with those in turn in the next 20 minutes or so. As we might expect in a medical text, which is what he was, health was a central issue. The Brahmins and kings of ancient India had very good reason for believing that the Anupa version was unhealthy because malaria was endemic there. Now malaria, like other diseases, may be endemic, which is to say it's constant and fairly regular intervals, or epidemic, which is occasional but commonly severe attacks. So epidemic means severe, <laughs> epidemic, uh, not so. There is a broad division of this map between the more endemic, I'm quoting now, between the more endemic areas, roughly corresponding to the wet zones in India, and the more epidemic areas, roughly corresponding to the semi-arid India. Within the epidemic, endemic areas, there are some tracts that are so highly affected that they are classified as hyper-epidemic, and that's where Roland and I work. <laughs> I'm always amazed by how, many, how few anthropologists die, don't die <laughs> during field work. We work in really terrible conditions. Um, and these hyper-epidemic areas include the hill forested hill tracks and also 
the deltaic areas of West Bengal. Now the hyperepidemic, hyperendemic conditions, he goes on to note, include a high rate of stillbirths and abortions, severe infections, and many deaths among young children. And a report from Western Bengal in 1947 noted that people were haggard and lethargic, that children were pot-bellied with enlarged spleens of chronic, from chronic malaria, and their physical condition is closely paralleled to their morale. The Buster Plateau was also a hyper-endemic area which no doubt accounts for its relative isolation. And it is by reference to the geography of malaria, Zimmerman notes, that the traditional polarity between the jungle and the Inuk, between the dry lands and the unhealthy marshlands, takes its full meaning. The distinction between the endemic and the epidemic areas was quite literally a matter of life and death. Basically, if you lived there, your chances of dying were very hard. The fact is fact, so we can see, these elite values coming from the West made very good sense. <laughs> Basically, if you want to live, you stay on this side. And the fact of this deadly opposition raises the question of how people in the wet zone survived in the past and how they survive today. The first point to make is that the correlation between the wet zones and, and the endemic malaria is generally true, but not universally so. That is to say, a general proposition has exceptions. And in the Bengal Delta is very interesting in this respect. The western zone of the Bengal Delta was relatively free of malaria because the water would rush down and wash away the mosquitoes. So there were, uh, but the other eastern area was endemic and called the dying delta. Now this ancient distinction between the unhealthy east and the relatively healthy west was an ever-present concern in India from ancient times until 1947 when a medical revolution happened. In 1944, military forces in India began to use DDT to control malaria. In 1945, it was made available for civilian use and produced absolutely remarkable results. The WHO, the World Health Organization, launched a large-scale malaria control program in 1947. Its rapid success brought about a revolution in health and demographic trends. One of India's main causes of death was largely removed. The use of DDT not only helped control mosquitoes and malaria, it improved life expectancy. The, the WHO program estimated reduced cases from 100 million to just 50,000 in 10 years. It's just it's quite extraordinary. I find it interesting in anthropology, we have these medical revolutions, but they don't seem to enter our consciousness as much as wars. <laughs> And uh, so he was a, a truly amazing medical revolution. By 1956, Spate and Learmont note, serious academic newcomers to India found it difficult to believe that malaria had an important factor in the lives of people. But of course, as we know, the subsequent discovery that DDT caused cancer and posed a threat to wildlife led some countries to ban it. It's banned in the USA, in Germany, I presume, uh, and in other parts of the world. And, um, but, um, <clears throat> um, but anyway, this legacy of the pre-1947 era is still with us, but the distinction today is, is in a much modified form. Tourists are advised that Western India is low to no risk, while Eastern India is high, is high to low risk. In sum, the values of the Brahmins and the kings about the superiority of the West made good medical sense and have done so from ancient times up until 1947. I now come to Zimmerman's second polarity, wheat versus rice. The geography, the cultural geography of wheat and rice correlates with this jungler Anupa distinction, which leads Zimmerman to ask whether uh, we have a frontier between two civilizations. 
And indeed, I would say it is. Wheat and rice are two of the most important staples in the world today, and when the food production maps are located in a global context, it becomes apparent that this jungler and nuka distinction in India is indeed on the frontier of two great civilizations. So we have the Indo-European civilization divides India east-west, and then the rice, <laughs> which divides it the other way around. So, um, and linguists have long established family relationships between the Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek, and other Indo-European languages, whilst archaeologists have charted the origin sites and dispersal of wheat farming throughout the, uh, this region. Now, the opposition between wheat and rice is of an altogether different order to the opposition between millet and rice. Millet goes everywhere in India and is widely regarded as the food of the poor. The rich eat wheat or rice and both have value systems that denigrate millet. So millet is the, the subaltern crop, even though nutritionally it's probably much better than both of them. <clears throat> The significant fact about the botanical relationship between wheat and rice is that it's a non-antagonistic relationship in the sense that they both have specialist ecological niches. Wheat prefers the dry temperate zone to the west, rice prefers the wetter conditions to the east. Furthermore, there is no overlap and the two can coexist as we can see here. There is this whole area is both wheat and rice, and they coexist harmoniously because um, uh, rice is a wet season crop, wheat is a cold season crop. So you can grow both, and indeed, people are now beginning to grow both. So where there is an overlap, they can both coexist, and um, um, which now <coughs> excuse me, raises the question of these different, what's different about them is the, the farming methods. Um, the thing about wheat farming is that it is by its very nature capital intensive. Wheat farmers are properly called seeders. They need machines to sow their seed. And whereas Rice farmers, especially those in China and Southeast Asia, are planters. As we can see there, their methods of production are incredibly uh, labour intensive. And you can see them transplanting here, and the rice, they just transplant the rice in exactly the right measurements. And it's a very labour intensive process. So, this transplantation method of rice farming we saw requires abundant supplies of water. And the, the, the valleys and volcanic hills of eastern monsoon Asia have water in abundance. But the plains of India have to rely on rain-fed irrigation with broadcast sowing, which is very inefficient. And um, so what we find in Buster, we find both methods are being used. And so it's a matter of if you... This is very labour intensive. If the rains don't come, you've wasted lots of labour. So, uh, and where the rains are more reliable, you have more of this stuff. Where they're unreliable, you get them seeding, uh, scattering uh, this, the grain by hand. Now, this distinction has an economic and cultural uh, correlations. Let me give you the economic fact, or the botanical facts first, and then we can look at the uh, cultural implications. Now, as I said before, but I'll say it again, <laughs> rice has an exceptionally high yield to seed ratio. A single grain of rice that is planted can yield as many as 2,000 on its, uh, 2, in its ears, which is why you always see rice bending down. <laughs> Wheat, I've noticed if you drive out of town here, it sticks up straight. <laughs> and why? Because it only one grain of wheat only gives you a maximum 400. <laughs> so there's no, it doesn't fall over. Now, the economic implication of this is that a wheat farmer must put aside about 25% of this, of this year's crop 
for the next year's seed. So it needs more capital. Whereas a, a rice farmer only has to put aside one or two percent of the crop. So, and um, so the um, and a second related fact is that rice can be cropped two to three times a year, whereas wheat can only be cropped three times over two years. In other words, we must let the land be fallow. And the implication of this, of course, is the carrying capacity of rice farming is much greater. And, um, and, but as the land's carrying capacity rises, so too does the demand for labour. And as Bray notes, the intensification of rice farming both permits and requires demographic increase. Agricultural development in wheat areas, by contrast, tends to be more extensive than, uh, and relies on economies of scale as a driving force. Increasing yields are associated with an increase in farm size and the introduction of labour-saving farm machinery run by men. This is important. <laughs> Rather than female labour. And this will be it. Thus, the development of economically more efficient farming systems has produced small labour farm, labour family farms in rice growing areas and large agro businesses in wheat growing areas. If wheat farming is to be called capitalist, then we perhaps, I think if Marx was born in China, he would have used the word labourist. <laughs> it's a very different situation. The third factor is climate. Rice requires temperatures between 10 and 20 degrees for germination as against 1 to 10 degrees for all other grains. It also requires a wet season for the vegetative and reproductive phages. Certain uh, areas of Asia provide this. Now these particularities of climate, crop and labour combine to give monsoon Asia the highest population density in the world. South Asia has a population density of 250 million per square kilometre, East Asia 130, this compares with 27 for Africa, 21 for North America, and 19 for South America. So it's just quite extraordinary. Now, we now come back to our sex ratio. Rice is a labour-intensive crop that requires the participation of women in the transplanting and harvesting phases. Wheat, by contrast, requires no female labour. And indeed, in Western India, women are in Perda, <laughs> and you never see women uh, in, uh, in, the, in the wheat fields. <clears throat> now this is very important in India where the population ratio of females per thousand males is significantly less, as I was saying at the beginning, in the wheat areas and growing worse. Um, and in some areas, and indeed it's as low as 754 to 100 in an area in the Punjab, which is the most important and highly developed area. So with development, we have the female ratio going down and the demand for um, amniocentesis rising. So the, <coughs> here's one answer to the question I raised at the beginning. There is, we can say, women in rice growing areas have more value as as uh, uh, their value, their labour is more valued. But it also has cultural and mythical implications. Um, <clears throat> the people of Buster make the crucial point that the process of lamb preparation for wheat and rice is radically different. Wheat requires straight farrows cut into dry land, which the seed is then, um, oops, which the seed is then thrown and covered over. Rice, by contrast, requires level wheat, wet land in which seedlings are transplanted. In other words, the word furrow, and this is crucial, is part of the lexicon of a wheat economy, not a rice economy. So the word furrow makes no sense to a rice farmer. And, and this is absolutely crucial for understanding the myths about Sita, who was born in a furrow. So once we understand that a furrow cannot be a wheat growing area, we find that Sita, in, in Sita, the word means furrow in Sanskrit. So, and the, the myth about Sita, which is very common, which has its origins in the wheat producing areas of the wet, 
is a story of how King Janet found Sita in a furrow while ploughing and adopted her. This is India's best known epic and Rama's victory over the demon Ravana, who then captures Sita, is ritually enacted every year. Rama is the husband of Sita and the many variations of this story exist. So Guru Mai's version of the Sita epic, you will remember from lecture one I think, she tells Sita is a reincarnation of Lakshmi. And according to uh, Guru Mai's Sukhdai's account, she tells a story of how Lakshmi stored her menstrual blood in a pot in a field for nine months. Then the farmer came across it and from this Lakshmi was born. So we get a whole different valuation of menstrual blood as being positive rather than negative. And, um, and there are many, many, many different stories of, of the Ramayana, but uh, this is a uh, main concern with the ones from central India. So the key thing here then, wheat requires furrows, furrows produce theta, rice does not. And, um, and so you have a, um, and even when they do farm in Busta, they, they do crisscross farming. So rice farmers plough the land in an altogether different way. So to grasp the metaphors and the poetic imagery, we must understand these basic differences between farming practices in these two places. And um, as I said here, wheat needs straight furrows on dry ground for the seeds. Rice needs levelled wetland and, um, and we find in India the traditional uh, wooden seeding plough is, uh, is now being um, replaced by these seeders. So I got this one. <coughs> right. Now, um, right, let me just go through that. All right, so the, the implication of that before I go on is that here, um, clearly, we can see the imagery, the poetic imagery is that Mother Earth is the source of wealth, makes sense in a wheat centric economy, which is the basis of even of the classical political economy. You'll find that in Marx. He quotes um, um, an ancient uh, economist saying, labor is the father of wealth, mother is the earth. But that is very much a wheat centric approach in India or in Asia, water is the mother of, 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 of wealth. Right. Now, um, right. now this brings me to the defining characteristics of the plough. The wheat plough is again very different to the rice plough. And the, um, the, the wheat plough has this mould board here for turning over the land. So you want the land to be refreshed and by turning it over it brings the nutrients back. But Wheat farming, uh, sorry, so the, um, the, the wheat farrows need to be deep in the soil turned over to bring nutrients to the surface. The mole board was an important invention because it created a furrow proper rather than just scratching the surface. Rice gets its principal nutrients from nourishment from water, wheat from the soil. The poets understand this fundamental principle as their imaginative relief shows. And then, this gives us our two myths of wealth. Just as water is the mother of rice, so earth is the mother of wheat. And the Lakshmi Jaga epic takes the next step and personifies the monsoon's reign as Queen Mangan and her daughter as Lakshmi. So there we are there, and we have, if you look at the myths about Sita, we find her mother is earth, Gumi, and uh, uh, Sita is to the pharaoh, and then um, and this is really the essence, the, the genealogical essence of the myths about Sita, and these are the genealogical essence. And I suspect too that in Fraser we'll probably find <laughs> myths about uh, Persephone and so on are variations on that theme. <clears throat> now, as I said, the metaphorical imagination of the 
sacred poets does not stop here. They extend the metaphors through the use of metonymy and, meta and, and metaphor and the classic, I won't bore you, this is sort of a mythical analysis 101. <laughs> we must distinguish between the metonymy or the principle of contiguity and the metaphor metonymy. A is to X is X is to B. And Ceta is to Pharaoh as Pharaoh is to wheat, which brings us a relationship between Ceta and wheat. In metaphor, says, this is Levi Strauss 101, <laughs> Uh, Lakshmi is to rice as elephant is to water, so you get a, a metaphorical association. And so the myth makers are doing this sort of stuff all the time and elaborating them in great detail. <coughs> now, um, so this brings me then to my third um, polarity that Zimmerman talks about, that is to say, animals. So we saw the dry was unhealthy, sorry, the dry was healthy versus unhealthy, the dry was wheat versus rice. The third is that the dry areas were associated with certain animals and the, um, the animals associated with the jungle include the horse, the ox, the donkey, the camel and the goat, but the most, two most important were the antelope, which is only found in India and it's prized for its flesh, and the elephant. The, the antelope, Zimmerman notes, is exclusively Indian and its distribution designs the limits of Brahmanical civilization. The black antelope is ranked foremost amongst all the jungle animals. It belongs to Brahmanical India of the dry west, not to the barbarian India in the wet marshy east. <clears throat> the skin of the antelope too was a very important key instrument of sacrifice. Of the elephant, Zimmerman has very little to say, but fortunately Thomas Troutman, another Indologist with an ancient historical and anthropological twist to his, uh, his, his work, has recently published a scholarly book on the Asian elephant, which is of course very different to the African elephant. His extraordinary wide-ranging analysis of the deep history of kings and elephant in India locates Hindu religious beliefs about the elephant in their political context by contrasting the Indian situation with Chinese and analysing the diffusion of Indian culture throughout Asia. This is one of the key statistics he starts off with, which in its sheet, it shows the um, estimates for wild and captive elephants. And it's interesting, he uses the word captive rightly because elephants aren't truly domesticated for reasons we'll show. They're captured. <laughs> and, um, but we can see in the beginning of the 20th century, 60% of all wild elephants were in India. In China, 225, virtually zero. So, and, and today we find um, uh, the captive elephants, 90% are in India and mostly the others are in Myanmar and Thailand because in both of those countries they're used as logging, which is a, a modern uh, development. Now the, <coughs> the problem that Troutman addresses is a fascinating one and uh, the, the question is um, why has this happened? <coughs> why does China have so few uh, few elephants relative. I mean, they had, historically, elephants are distributed evenly out over the whole of monsoon Asia. But in China, they have disappeared virtually, and uh, some people argue it's due to degradation. But they are still persisting and being resilient in the, in the, in the East. And um, so, his question is, why have the elephant numbers retreated in China and persisted in India? Fortunately, he gives a one-paragraph answer from his 300-page book, and let me quote from it. <laughs> the striking difference between India and China in this matter, I propose, lies not in the literary, philosophical, or religious ideas, but in the relation of kings to elephants. To come to the end point, Indian kingdoms and Indianizing kingdoms of Southeast Asia, that is to say those parts of Southeast Asia where Hindu culture was taken up, are states in which wild elephants were captured and trained for war, whereas the use of the war elephant never took root in China. 
Indeed, we may say that the Chinese kings were exposed to warfare using elephants, but they refused to adopt it as a battle technique. An India-China comparison in this matter would involve examining many differences, including the garden-style agriculture of China, which I think is crucial, and its intensive reliance on human labour, as against Indian agriculture with its reliance on domesticated animals and the pasturing of grazing animals, I would say, <laughs> the wheat, wheat economy. We can use the history of the war elephant to shed further light on this subject. It helps to explain the contrast between, on the one hand, China, where the elephants have largely retreated, and on the other, in Southeast Asia, where wild elephants uh, have persisted. Now, what is at stake here is the role of king as valuer of land. To use Troutman's words, I quote, there appears to be a fundamental choice of preference about how land should be petitioned. It is what I call, I'm quoting him, a land ethic a dominant ideology in its own right. The word rice does not appear in the index of Troutman's book, but it is clear from that this argument harmonises with the contrasts I have been developing. Indian-type farming, we saw, is relatively inefficient. Um, uh, Indian-type farming is a relatively inefficient type of rice farming. Chinese rice farming, on the other hand, is highly efficient, and we saw that the Chinese kings valued rice over other forms and arrogated to themselves the role, the ritual role, as first farmer. And we saw that in China, rice is highly valued, then wheat, and then um, millets, and that was elaborated in great detail, in the, and still elaborated in detail, in the ploughing ethics. The <coughs> in India, the land ethic in ki India, Troutman argues, valued the king as a warrior, not the king as a farmer, and pro uh, prioritised politics over religion. And I quote again, there is every indication that forms and meanings flow from the war elephant to other functions of elephant, from kingship to religion, not the other way around. The kings of India divinised the elephant, but in a radically different way from the guru Mahas of Buster, whose contrary values I began this lecture. But before I get back to these, I want to tie up the threads of this lecture. And it is necessary to briefly elaborate on what he means by this, uh, what Troutman means by this land ethic. Again, I quote, I'm a rice eater, I need a lot of water. <laughs> I'm quoting, because of their bigness, elephants must consume large amounts of fodder daily, as they do not become fit for work until they reach the age of 20. So in other words, up until 20, the elephant is useless as a worker. It is uneconomical to raise them in stables and to collect food for them during the, young, the long years of their unproductive youth. It is only practical to capture them as wild adults. Elephants can and do reproduce in captivity, but not at a rate high enough to obviate the need for further capture. And in any case, it is simply uneconomical, as a general rule, to rely on captive breeding. This being so, the kings of India have a direct interest in protecting wild elephants in forests for, for capture and training. They need the help of forest people. The relations of kings to elephants, in fact, he says, is a four-cornered relationship between kings, elephants, forests, and forest people. A rich and complex field of relationships. Studying it holds out the promise of bringing the forest and its inhabitants into the history of kingdoms. This is the place that people like Roland and I work in. <laughs> and instead of looking upon them as the antithesis of the kingdoms, of farmers and farming. In short, all that makes up what he calls civilization. The story will not be the same area, everywhere. It is different in India from that in China, and therefore holds the potential of clarifying the environmental aspects of the difference. The Indian king then needed large forests to produce his war elephants. And I should say too, the best war elephants were the male elephants, who were, um, What's that word term called when they're? Um, it's a special word when they 
uh, fluid comes from their ears and basically to use a, they, when they're horny, <laughs> they're hot, huh? There's some, some technical word will come to me in a minute. The, 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 if the elephant was the key instrument of warfare, then rice was the, war, was the key thing for the Chinese king, needed to feed its warriors manning the Great Wall to the north. The political economy of the Indian king was based foremost, first and foremost on wife, on wheat and the pastoral economy of the dry zone, with secondary assistance from rice. The archaeological evidence reveals a steady expansion of wheat cultivation from Delhi down the, the Gangetic Plain. Rice, for its part, has moved in the opposite direction. But this was not the class of cultures, but the subordination of rice to the needs of the warrior king. The contrary values of the, the latter persist in the epic songs of the Guru Mahas of the Blaster Plateau. Needless to say, these values remained restricted to a tiny, relatively unhealthy area of the Buster Plateau, but they are subaltern values in a triple sense. They are the values of women, not men. They celebrate rice, not wheat. And they celebrate the uh, wet zone over the dry zone. Lakshmi epitomises these values. Her worship as rice goddess and daughter goddess may not, help, may not explain why girl babies are not devalued in the West, but it does tell us something about the relative valuation of girl babies in the East where the sex ratios show no bias. Thank you.